Hello, everybody. Today, we are doing a Q&A session on what you need to know for your art school portfolio. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Tell me in the chat if you are applying to art school this year, if you are thinking about it as a future pursuit, and tell us if you did that many decades ago, <laughs> like me. I applied to art school in 1994. Yeah, that is a really long time ago. And oh boy, things have changed so much since I applied to an art school portfolio. In some ways, I think, although all the resources here are really nice to have, I know that for a lot of art school applicants, it's very stressful to see other people's portfolios, to feel like your work doesn't measure up to all of those my accepted art school portfolio videos that you just can't help but watch every single one of them. And I also feel like things were better when none of us saw anybody's portfolios. If you didn't have friends that were applying that you met through maybe, let's say, a summer art program or something like that, and if no other kids at your school were applying, you pretty much had no idea what other people were making. And so this is a new landscape that a lot of people who are applying to art school have to deal with. And so a big question that a lot of students ask me is, well, how am I gonna find my voice? For my art school portfolio, they're saying that they wanna see me engage with subject matter. They want me to show my voice. And I just find that whole phrase, show your voice is so frustrating for so many students because it's so vague. It's like when people say to you, be yourself. That's not helpful either because <laughs> I don't know when I was in high school, I certainly did not know who I was at the time. You're still figuring that out. I mean, you pretty much do that your entire life. And one of the most effective ways I think to prepare a portfolio is to be very conscious of cliches. What is something that everybody else is gonna be doing? How can I avoid that? And you'd be surprised that oftentimes people don't even know what the cliches are. It's not so easy to know that unless somebody like us <laughs> tells you what those are. And so we do have a video on art cliches and how to identify them and avoid them. And I really think that should be the first step for pretty much anyone who's applying for an undergraduate degree in art school, because just knowing, okay, these are the things that everybody else is gonna do, that's a huge leap. The other thing too is that I think a lot of people don't realize that one thing that can be very helpful is to put yourself in the mindset of an admissions officer. Now picture this, at any of the major art schools, there's gonna be a whole team of admissions officers who do the first multiple rounds and everything to get it down to a smaller pool of students. And I'm sorry to tell you all this, but they are gonna look at your slides so fast they're not gonna have time to read two paragraphs that you write in the caption for a single artwork. They're not gonna watch a 15 minute film that you shot. And that is something to really remember because we are so invested in our work. We feel deeply about what it is we do. But the thing is we forget that, oh, I spent 10 hours in this drawing. Oh my gosh, the admissions officer is gonna look at it like this and be done. I know it's sort of crushing <laughs> to think about how little attention 
they're going to spend on each image, but there's a good reason why, because they're looking at thousands and thousands of applications. And I think that's one point of view that I just don't see a lot of art school candidates doing. They're very much in themselves, which is important. You do have to be there to do your portfolio. But when you think about it from the perspective of an admissions officer who's just going through portfolio after portfolio, you imagine a lot of those cliches and things that everybody's doing, they start to get really repetitive because you've seen them a billion times. So when something pops up, that is not the cliche, okay, photorealistic eye in the center of the page. It really does stand out quite a bit. Amanda says, what? I never actually applied, but I got in. Okay, you're going to have to explain that, Amanda. <laughs> I don't really know how that works necessarily. Anna says, MFA 10 years ago, do private tutoring for portfolio development for MFA BFA, always looking for advice to pass on my students are navigating a vastly different landscape. I think the problem now is that students who are applying to art school it's just so oversaturated. I think about what's available on our channel, okay? We have so many playlists. And I think at this point, we've been doing portfolio critiques for many years now. I think we have over 35 portfolio critiques of undergraduate portfolios. And I mean, I feel like just watching our <laughs> portfolio critiques, that's already a ton of information. And I think it would be fine if you're watching it to learn, which is what a lot of people watch them for. But the thing is, when you're applying to art school, you're watching them with a very different mindset because you're looking at those portfolio critiques as competition. That's the problem. It's one thing to watch a video that's a critique. It's another thing to say, OK, here are the people I'm competing with. This is what everybody else is doing. I can tell you all, I would find it absurdly stressful. I mean, I guess there's a reason why they have that word. Ignorance is bliss. I think things maybe were better when I had no idea what people were doing in the world who were my age. You just didn't really see it that much. Or if you did see it, you'd be exposed to it very briefly. It wasn't something where, okay, you could just click and watch 15 portfolio critiques in a row. It would be maybe isolated to, okay, you have this one class at school or maybe you took a summer program. And so it wasn't something that was with you all the time. And I think that's the problem now is that it's all extremely accessible. Yeah, Amanda says so many young kids look so talented. And I hear so often in our Discord and all kinds of other places, people will say, well, listen, I saw portfolio it was by a student who is my age and their work is so much better. My work isn't even close to being as good as their work. And that is also really paralyzing for a lot of students. And I feel for all of you who are applying because this is just, it's too much. I don't know. In the 90s, we just didn't care. <laughs> we were like, oh, here's the application you mailed away for the hard copy catalog. You wrote with a pencil or pen. You filled out the application. And we had slides. Okay, everybody, we did not have digital photography back then. And in some ways, I really think things are a lot tougher now. Oh, to be clear, Anna, we're talking about undergrad today because I know that for a lot of people, this is the home stretch. Most of the undergraduate program deadlines, most of them are February 1st, although some of them are March 1st as well. Oh, Amanda says, friend of mine was taking some art classes while I was already in college. She invited me to some classes and the profs, I guess, were impressed. They waved me. Oh, wow. That is a fabulous way to get into art school because it's expensive to apply to all these places. Those application fees definitely add up. Oh, yeah, slides. <laughs> Who here remembers slides? Oh, my gosh. I remember I used to get my slides 
developed at this place in New York City that was fantastic. I can't remember what their name was, but and they they really had a good deal, and it was fifty cents a slide. Each college wanted twenty images or so, and just do the math, okay? And then when you get out of school, I was applying for teaching positions. I need to have 20 slides of my work and 20 slides of student work. So every application was 40 slides that I, oh, and by the way, paper postage. <laughs> That's the other thing that was extremely painful. We had to actually load the freaking slide carousel. Young kids, I don't think any of you know what I'm talking about. All I'm saying is be grateful that digital photography exists. Oh, C. Cantrell says, had a similar situation at SAIC. I was taking classes as a student at large and finally applied and just got in without a portfolio. Oh, wow. Boy, are those days over now. Everything is just so oversaturated. And I think the number of applicants that's applying now is significantly higher than it was. And so getting into art school is tougher now. My husband almost failed high school. And he still was able to get the credit last minute and eventually went to RISD. I say to him all the time, listen, if you apply to RISD today, you would not get in because your grades were not very good. And I think now there's just so many people applying that they can really say, listen, you have to have pretty high grades to get into the school. And so tell us in the chat, who here is applying this year? And another thing I wanted to address was the emotional burden of applying to art school. It's so stressful now. And I feel for all of you. So if you're stressed about your application, you have every right to be. And I don't know that I have amazing advice to make all that stress go away necessarily. But I think even if you don't get in, remember the art school does not determine your life. So a lot of students will say, oh, if I go to this school, I'll get a job. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> oh, if I don't go to that school, I will never get a job. No way. And so yes, art school is helpful. There are all kinds of benefits to going, but I just think it's not that straightforward. I don't think a program determines your life. And I know a lot of people who went to very prestigious programs who really did not do anything. And mostly because they were lazy, they didn't do any of the work, and they really wasted an extraordinary opportunity. And actually, it makes me really mad because you think about how many people who want to attend one of those programs, but financially can't do it. I mean, that really upsets me that that is the case. And so when I was teaching at RISD, I would have kids who were disrespectful and were clearly not there to do anything. And all I could think in my head was you are taking the spot of somebody who is dying to study and who would work hard and would take advantage of this opportunity. And that's just not fair in my opinion that it's so much based on who can pay. And art schools are notoriously not great with financial aid, unfortunately. Anna says, I have three students now who are applying. They're calling me at 3 a.m. asking me to help stave off panic attacks. I always say I don't take on private students I don't believe in. Oh my gosh, that's so hard. And the thing is, we do the best we can to help all of you who are applying. We have the resources on our channel and we have support in the Discord as well. But at a certain point, there's only so much we can do to help people with their portfolios. And so I'm here to tell all of you, <sighs> just come here and commiserate with us. That's the only advice I can give all of you is come here and tell us how you feel. Come on. I know there are 23 people watching the stream right now, and I'm waiting for one of you to come here and say, yes, I'm applying. Yes, I'm freaking out. Because you know what? If one person types that, other people will say, oh my God, yes, me too. So if you're freaking out about your application, you are not alone. Even though everybody looks like they have it totally in the can, that is not true. 
And a lot of students will say that to me. They'll say, oh, well, that person's all set. I can tell because no, they're all having a fit inside themselves as well. Amanda says, insecurities and self-judgment I had when I applied for undergrad kept me from even applying for a more prestigious school. Yeah, I totally feel that all the time. Students will say, well, I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to apply. I always say if you can, I mean, I know application fees. I know that they add up and stuff. But if you can afford it, don't eliminate yourself. Let them eliminate you. Because you know something? If they eliminate you, you haven't lost anything. You have every opportunity to gain something if you just put yourself out there. Because, you know, yeah, it stinks to be rejected. But the thing is, if you don't apply, it's like you'll never know. And I don't want to live with that degree of regret. Oh, thank you, Art Sinique. I'm so glad that you came on to tell us about freaking out because chances are there's a lot of other people watching the stream who are freaking out as well. So if you watch the stream, maybe even on the replay, tell me in the comments, are you freaking out? So we can all acknowledge that it is okay to feel so anxious about it. I mean, I'm anxious just thinking about it. I'm not even the person who's applying right now. We also have Lilith DeCatz. I've been applying, but honestly thinking of DIYing my education, work a day job like Franz Kafka and employee insurance, but with art instead of literature. I love that. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I do believe that the world is very different, not just in terms of the saturation of people applying, but it's also saturated in terms of educational opportunities. When I was a kid, there was no YouTube. If you didn't go to art school, you had to take just classes. I mean, you could not learn very much on your own. I mean, yeah, there's art books, but compared to what's available online now, it's absurd. And so for the longest time, I was so, oh, yeah, yeah, go to art school. But I, I just don't think it's necessary the way it was before. Don't get me wrong. There are advantages and disadvantages to everybody's situation. Ultimately, you have to do what's best for you. But I think this should be reassuring to people that what's available online can create other opportunities. And it can also fill in the gaps. Because actually, I was talking to a RISD student the other day, and they had taken an intaglio class, and they said that they felt like there were all these things that were missing. So of course, I was like, okay, go watch my dry point video, because <laughs> you can rewind. Intaglio print making so many steps. And I was saying to myself, oh, dude, if I'd had this when I was learning intaglio print making, it would have been much better. Nacho is asking, how are portfolios from transfer students different from those from students who enter art school their freshman year? I'll have to prepare for that. I don't think they're vastly different. For a lot of people, it's not like, well, it depends on the person, obviously. But typically speaking, transfer students tend to be people who did their freshman year at another college or trying to transfer. So it's not like they took 30 years off and came back. They don't have a huge amount of time to be that much better in terms of their skill set. But one difference that I think would be important if you do apply as a transfer student, most colleges will have you transfer into a major. So for example, at RISD, freshman year, everybody takes the same classes. Sophomore year, you're in your major. So when you apply as a transfer student, you have to tell them, hey, I want to transfer as a film student. Whereas if you come in as a freshman, you don't have to do that because you pick your majors later. And so I do think it is helpful to have work in your portfolio that is relevant to your intended major. You can have that too as a first year student as well. But that can be something to think about because you do want to show them, hey, I want to be a film major. Maybe here's some work that demonstrates my interest in that area. Kara Sue says, I know fan art and portfolio is a bad idea. Artwork of original characters in an anime or cartoon style, okay. Should I stick with all realism, even though that's not my idea? Realism is not better. <laughs> realism is one way. 
I think it's totally fine to have original characters, but I would be very careful about it looking close to anime because, listen, I have no problem with manga and anime. I think it's fine. And I've had so many conversations with people over the years about, well, why can't we? And what if it's in my own style? What if I, it's just a blanket thing with art school admissions. They just don't want to see it. In my opinion, instead of asking over and over, but why, what if I just make other stuff? <laughs> That's much more worth your time. Because if you know for sure from multiple resources that art schools don't like fan art, that they don't like manga and anime, just don't do it, okay? It's a waste of your time because they are absolutely adamant about that. Realism can be boring. Realism is not inherently engaging. So I don't think I would equate what's acceptable with a certain genre. No genre or subject or media or style is always gonna get great results. It depends on who's doing it and how they're doing it. And I would just try to think about it in terms of showing, well, that annoying phrase, showing your voice, doing something that's not what everybody else is gonna be doing. Okay, we have Red3, who is also majorly freaking out. I'm so glad that you're all telling me that you're freaking out. So who else is freaking out? We, we need more hands. I know there are more of you watching <laughs> who are freaking out. And I suspect those of you who are telling us you're freaking out, doesn't it make you feel a little bit better to know that there are other people that feel the same way? That is, in my opinion, it's a small comfort, but it's something because you can do some of the other things like people oftentimes say, well, go focus on other things. It's like, are you crazy? I, you can't focus on other things. It's really hard. I mean, I feel like if you said, oh, Clara, you got a date with Hugh Jackman this Saturday. Don't think about it. I'm like, are you crazy? I'm thinking about that night and day. <laughs> I don't know what world that would happen, but anyway. <laughs> oh, this is really nice to have support from people who are not applying. Anna says, it sucks. No getting around it. Stress gets to be pretty unbearable at times. Wish I could help more. Amanda also says, you are not alone. Well, Amanda and Anna, the fact that the two of you are supporting everybody who's here in the chat, freaking out, that means something. Karasu says, when I said idea, I meant career goal. Oh, I see. Okay, so what you were saying, which I didn't interpret correctly, should I stick with realism even though it's not my career goal? It's way too soon to be thinking about career goals. Don't even go there because that is going to limit your opportunities. I know people very much want to know about the future. People want to know about, well, is this viable? And it's just way too soon. I mean, so much changes in your life between... <laughs> going to art school and getting a job. It, it just, I, I think it's a fruitless endeavor. I think it just adds pressure to you. I, I just don't think it's necessary. I think make really compelling work. Experiment with different art supplies. Do mixed media, make an artwork that is not a rectangle. Make a 3D sculpture. Do all the stuff that a lot of people don't do. I can tell you all right now, if you have a 3D piece in your portfolio, that will make you stand out because most people don't. I'd have to see the 3D piece <laughs> to see if it's good for your portfolio, but that, that's the type of thing you want to spend your time on. Don't spend your time saying, oh, well, everybody said I should do this because if you're making something because you think you should, you're already dragging your feet and that's already almost making the piece dead in the water because you've already decided in advance that it's a drag. Art Sinique says, would you recommend putting experimental pieces in a college portfolio along with sketchbook pieces too? Art Sinique, if you can clarify what you mean by experimental pieces, because that's a pretty broad word and sketchbook pieces, yes, but 
I think sketchbook spreads tend to be more effective in a portfolio when they demonstrate your thinking process, your brainstorming. So for example, some people might have sketchbook pages where they're sketching portraits or they're sketching something that they're just looking at. And I tend to like seeing the ideation process. I like seeing you doing visual research and taking notes and how you get from one thing to another. And so in my opinion, sketchbook spreads are the most informative about your process, which is absolutely part of the portfolio, when we can see the thinking, okay? Yes, people use sketchbooks in all different kinds of ways. I'm not saying that's the way all sketchbooks should be, but I'm saying for the purpose of the context of an art school portfolio, that is, I think, the best use of a sketchbook spread. Sophie says, I'm applying to RISD. Do you have any tips for the portfolio do's and don'ts? I would really take a look at our video. I think it was the very first slide that I showed. Um, this one, how you can stand out, okay? This stream, I go over all of the things that most people don't do. Most people do not make a painting that is not a rectangle. A rectangle is the default shape that people usually pick when they sit down to paint something. Most people do not do mixed media. And what I mean by mixed media, I'm not talking about, oh, watercolor, you add some colored pencils. I mean, get a piece of burlap and put hot glue over it, paint it with acrylic, and then sculpt it, that type of thing. Something that really is engaging with the material in a very tactile manner. And those are the kinds of things that you don't see that often in an art school portfolio. And so I would take a look at the stream because we go over a lot of that. But a lot of the don'ts, avoid those cliches, avoid the fan art, the manga anime style stuff. That's all very straightforward. And for those of you who are very upset about that, I'm sorry. It's just, this is not my decision. That's just the way things are. Izzy says, is art school worth it? I feel that the debt will not be worth it and going will just put me in a worse situation. I want to be in galleries, selling my art in auctions in art shows. It's such a personal question, Izzy. I think for a lot of people, the financial part of it plays a major role. And I'm not gonna ask you about your personal financial situation, but I do think if you can do it, without going into major debt. Like if it's a huge burden for your family, don't do not do it, okay? Because that's just going to create so much hardship for you later on. And again, that's personal. Like I don't know what is too much debt, fine amount of debt. It's totally up to the person. But I can tell you that you probably want to look at some of the options as far as the art world. Because I think a lot of the times what people think an art field is like, it's not actually what they think it's like. I had a student who really wanted to go into graphic design. And when she took the graphic design major at RISD Summer Pre-College, she couldn't believe that it was all digital, that they were not really doing a lot of traditional media. Now, it depends on the program. Some programs are a little bit more traditional. But she said to me, oh my gosh, I had no idea I was going to have to do this much digital media. If this is really what graphic design is, I don't want to do it because I like tactile things that are messy and that I can really maneuver physically. And so some of this is doing the research, but there are lots of really big advantages. I mean, a big one is connections. You, you meet people who actually are showing at galleries who are professors at the school. And that's not a small thing, that network that you instantly are plugged into. But just because you go to school doesn't mean you're going to get those contacts. I mean, a big part of contacts and networking is you going for it. People think they'll just show up at a party and boom, they just get no. You have to take the initiative. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to, yes, talk to people and make friends and all those kinds of things. So it. None of this is a straight shot. 
is what I'm trying to explain. It's many layers of so many parts of life that are very difficult to tell. But yes, if it's a huge hardship, don't don't do it. It's just, I mean, I would never want to feel like I should tell people, yes, go into this massive debt because there are other options out there in a way that was not the case before. Yeah, Anna says blanket, no, to anime. Thank you, Anna, for validating that. And oh, nice, Anna says some of my students are here, not going to out them, but that's why I'm here. Cool, well, I'm glad we can all hang out here together. Yeah, and I just think that, here, here's the thing about the portfolios, okay? You're gonna hear stuff about making portfolios that you don't wanna do, okay? Probably when I said, oh, make some 3D work and, and tell me, it's okay to confess. <laughs> How many of you, when I said, oh, make 3D work, went, oh, I don't wanna make 3D work or, oh, I don't, I don't know how to do that. How many people had that reaction, okay? Or how many people thought, oh, 3D work? I, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how to do that. Tell us in the chat, because what I like about our channel is that I really think it's important that people who are in the community, who are artists, that we help each other, that we help each other to see you're not bats for feeling these ideas, for being frustrated that you're being told, oh, you should do 3D. I mean, that's what happened when I went to RISD is that I was required to take 3D design. I had no interest in 3D, okay? I went to RISD to be a figurative painter. I was all in on oil painting. 3D, why would I need this? But 3D, my freshman year, first semester, my favorite class of that semester. And really, I, I just had to be thrown <laughs> into a situation because I don't know that I ever would have done that. And so a big part of the art school portfolio process, if you want to do the stuff that stands out, you have to do stuff that feels really unfamiliar or you're like, oh my God, I'm not good at this. You're going to feel that way about a lot of things. Tell us in the chat who here has made portfolio pieces where you have started them and go, oh my gosh, I'm really bad at this. This was a terrible idea to try this. But the thing is, that is the stuff that makes you stand out. It's the stuff that not everybody has been doing forever. Lisa says, should the portfolios look cohesive or should you demonstrate a variety of styles? Variety of styles for undergraduate. Graduate program cohesive. Very, I mean, the basically opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of portfolios. And Artsy Neek says, very lots of pieces like mixed media pieces or pieces where you have no plan and just create it. Sure. I don't think they care if you had a plan. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you have to explain every single piece. And I think there is certainly an argument for learning how to work really spontaneously. I wish I could do it more. I'm just super uptight <laughs> and I don't like working spontaneously, but try both. I think the important thing about being an artist, there's nothing that is always good or always bad, but you should, I think, try to be a well-rounded artist so that you're not writing off 80% of what you could do as an artist. Because I really truly believe a lot of it is mindset. A lot of the times people don't wanna to listen to me when I give them art school advice is because they don't want to see or acknowledge that something might be good. And I, I've had situations myself as a student where I saw something and I was like, I don't like that. I, I, I don't like the way that looks. I have no interest in learning it. But what I'm saying is, hey, that might be your first impression. Like who here, <laughs> this is really good analogy. Who here, think about one of your close friends, okay? How many people, when you met your best friend or a really close friend, you didn't like them at first? I, I had a friend at RISD pre-college when I was in high school and I did not like her. I was like, oh my gosh, she's so stuck up. I was like, ugh. I don't like her at all. We're like best friends now. <laughs> and I've known her since the 90s and we're super close. So maybe that art format, that technique that you have been just 
blah, stubborn about wanting to do, maybe that is, it could be your best friend, but because you're not giving it any chance, you're never going to know if you're going to have that best friend. Actually, I had another best friend who, this is so weird. The second I met her, I knew we were going to be friends. I don't know what it was. There was, she, I wasn't even talking to her. We were sitting at a table at a faculty meeting and I saw her sitting across the table. I was like, she's going to be my friend. <laughs> so you just never know. Crispy says, can you go a bit into detail in scholarships going to art school without a wealthy background? Yeah, scholarships are not easy to get for art school. There's some, but the thing that's very frustrating to me about a lot of grants is that they're super specific. A lot of them will say, you have to be somebody who lives in Wisconsin and you come from a family of educators. It's always something super specific. And so the problem is there are grants out there, but there aren't a lot for art students. And there aren't a lot that are really grants that your average art school student could apply to because so many of them are based on the region you're from or about your background in some way. And we do have a list of student grants on artprof.org. If you just go into artprof.org and you click on the search bar, just type in student grants and you'll find that list. But there, there's very, very few crispy. I'm sorry to tell you that. Sophie says, know that RISD, for example, recommends observational work. Is there a way to make something like a regular figure drawing stand out? Okay, here's what you do, Sophie. You don't tell yourself it's a regular figure drawing. <laughs> like the second you're like, oh, yeah, it's a regular figure drawing. It's not exciting anymore. You, you really can choke your idea before you've even picked up pen to paper. And I think so much of this if you're going to observe something and draw it, don't have the mindset of, oh, I got to draw something from observation because RISD told me to. Don't do that. Walk around somewhere. I don't know if you like to, well, it's kind of cold out right now, but anywhere you are, okay? And you walk around, let's say you go for a walk and you notice something and you're like, wow, that is really beautiful. I love that leaf. That happens to me all the time when I go for walks. I'll just find something. I'm not even planning to find it or I'll notice a scene or I'll, I'll pick up a branch or something like that. Sometimes I'll bring it home. Other times I'll have to go back and paint it. That's what makes it stand out is you noticing that. Because a lot of people would say, oh, leaves, they're really boring to draw. Who wants to draw a leaf? But if you find one that you are entranced by, maybe there's something about the shape of it, Maybe you like the texture of it. That makes it special because you saw something in that leaf that somebody else wouldn't have saw, seen. You know, maybe you look at this leaf and it's so beautiful to you and you show it to me and I'm like, Ugh, boring. I don't want to draw that. <laughs> so the concept here is that you have to find things that you are genuinely excited about. The second you guys put it on this checklist of, okay, do the still life. You know, a lot of people say to me, oh, I don't want to do still life. That's so boring. And I feel bad for still life <laughs> because everybody thinks that they're boring. And I'm like, you know what? If your still life is boring, that's your fault. You have to find a way to make still life exciting. So I did that myself. I was like, I'm going to go buy all the things for my still life. You guys can find it if you just type in art prof setup into YouTube, you'll find a video where Alex Rowe and I set up all these objects that I bought in Chinatown. And I bought all those objects because I thought they were beautiful. I bought this bright pink dragon fruit. I bought this massive jackfruit, which totally rotted a few days later. But the point is I bought things I liked. Now, if you sit me down and say, Clara, you have to paint this apple. I'm like, I'm out of here. You have to find something that you genuinely are excited about. Willish says, 3D work has always seemed like too much work for me to get into. It's not. No, 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 no. You can do so much with very meager supplies. So one of my favorite 3D prompts, which is a pretty low entry point for a lot of people, 
is to make a chipboard or cardboard sculpture. You can find it on our channel or go to rprof.org and just type chipboard into the search bar and the lesson will come up. But that is such an easy lesson and it's super flexible. You can do amazing stuff. Like if you look at the lesson page, we have all these examples of students who have done that project. And if you look at those examples, you'll be like, what? This is just cardboard? So a lot of this, again, is for us, a lot of times the 3D work, there's like a barrier that makes us think we can't do it. Oh, it's too hard. It's too expensive. I don't know where to begin. And so we're trying to be the entry point for you. We're trying to come in here and say, hey, it's not as hard as you think. Here are the resources. Go do that. And we're here to help you all with that. So if you are all interested in any 3D projects, go to artprof.org and there is a 3D area under Learn and Create that you can all find. Izzy says, I love 3D work. I want to do clay sculpture specifically so bad, but it's so expensive. I just can't do that right now. I love 3D art in general, though. It's so fun. I wonder if my sculpture... I guess it's still downstairs. The thing about clay sculpture, though, Izzy, is you can buy plastiline, which is oil-based clay. You use it over and over and over again. I have these bunches of oil-based clay I've had for over 15 years. I just keep using them. And you can just get one block. You don't have to get the nice brand. You can get the inexpensive brand, just get a hunk of wood, and you can just sculpt on there. You don't even need an armature. And I think that's the other thing is people think, oh, I need to build all these things. It's like, no, you, a piece of wood and some clay, that's all you need. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Yes, this is really good advice. I think it was somebody who asked earlier about galleries. BFA students rarely get into galleries right after school. That's not the reason you should do it. It will make you a much better artist, but it's only worth it if you really, really want it. I think I would add 50 more really <laughs> because I thought I really wanted it. And I, I, I don't want to say I gave up really quickly, but I didn't give it as long as a lot of people do because I, it wasn't right for me. Like I, that's what I thought I wanted. I thought I wanted to be a gallery artist. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? That was not a good fit <laughs> for the type of artist that I am. King Casey says, for my AP portfolio, I planned a large variety of styles, but tied them together with a specific color scheme. Is that a good idea for places like RISD BFA portfolios? I don't think it needs to be like that. I think that that might actually limit you more. I think you'd be better off just not having a plan like that. I know for AP portfolio, it's different because you're doing it in the context of the AP program. And I don't know a lot about AP. I didn't do AP, I haven't taught it or anything, but with a portfolio, you, you just, you want to remove anything that is a roadblock to you learning and experimenting and pushing yourself. And so any limit that says, okay, I'm going to tie it together with this. All 20 pieces have this. That's a limitation more so. And it's, it's not necessary. Like, you know, if they said on the application, yes, you need to do this. Sure. But they don't say that. And so I'm a fan of leaving things more open. So you feel that you have the capacity to make those changes. So it looks like we have a bunch of people who joined. Tell us in the chat who here is applying this year. If you're freaking out and if you say you are not freaking out, you're totally lying. <laughs> Tell us if you are applying, if you want to apply sometime. Or if you have an art school experience, maybe you went to art school and maybe you graduated 20 years ago. Tell us about that. AA is asking, would you recommend adding animation in a portfolio? I would if you really are interested in it. Again, if it's a, oh, well, if I do animation, it'll make me look cool. No, <laughs> like you have to really do animation. The thing is though, like 3D, you don't have to know that much about animation to make a pretty good animated piece for a portfolio. And one thing that I really like about Deep D's approach to animation, she keeps it so simple that 
it makes it so really anybody including me because i know nothing about animation and i'm one of those people i look at animation and go oh this is too hard too complicated blah, blah blah she makes it very very accessible so we have a video on how to do a ball bounce okay now at first you might say oh ball bounce that's so boring i can't do that for my portfolio but see and lark reese who taught me how to do the ball bounce he showed me how you can add all these things to the thing that's bouncing. And so the animation technique is ball bounce, but what you can do with the ball bounce can be really, really fun. And the other piece of advice I would say too about animation, keep it short. Even a uh, animation that's two minutes is too long. And you might even think about just making animated GIFs. Animated GIFs can be fantastic. And sometimes if the animated GIF is not a <laughs> epic 20 minute long, animated film, which I would never recommend to anybody, it's going to be a lot more manageable. So the thing about the animation, it doesn't have to be complicated. And I think so often people buy it off more than they can chew with animation. And then what happens is it doesn't really become about the animation. Sometimes people, they design this like really complicated character and then they have a lot of trouble animating it because the character is too complicated. And so sometimes the most simple thing, ball bounce, walk cycle, rotoscoping, and doing stop motion. We have tutorials on all of those. Just type those into artprof.org and you'll find those tutorials. <laughs> Amanda says, fell in love with Chalk Pestle last summer. Never ever thought I'd be friends with that medium. I didn't hate Chalk Pastels, but I think I just was too close-minded when I used them. I used them in art school. I guess they were okay, but I really like them now because I think I'm using them so that I tend to tackle more of their special talents. I don't think I was really doing that when I was in art school. Izzy says, feel like it's a very obvious question, just not educated, but what other things do you need art portfolios for? All kinds of things. If you want to work at an animation studio, you need to have a portfolio that demonstrates that you have the skills. If you are working with a gallery and they want to see the body of work that you have, if you apply for a grant or a residency, you have to submit your portfolio so they can see what type of work you're making, if they want to accept you for that grant of the residency, if you're an editorial illustrator, and you want a newspaper to hire you to do editorial illustrations, you have to show your portfolio to the art director so they know, oh, this is the type of illustration that you do. So there are tons of situations where you might need one. There's other situations where you just don't. So <laughs> I mean, you don't need a portfolio to sell artwork. You can sell whatever you want. Nobody cares if you have a cohesive portfolio in that situation. And so that's a great question. It's not obvious at all. <laughs> See, I think it's extremely confusing for a lot of people. And unless you really are knowledgeable about the fields, it's really not information that's easy to get. Sophie says, I know that some schools want a breadth of work. Portfolio is mainly surrounded around one theme. However, use a very wide range of media. Do you think that is okay? It's hard for me to give you an accurate answer without seeing the portfolio, Sophie, because I don't know how diverse the work is stylistically or subject matter wise, but I would advise not doing one theme. Again, it's a situation where you're creating limitations for yourself. So I would say it's much better to leave it very open-ended. Luis, if still life is boring to you, it's your fault. <laughs> That's my attitude about still life. And it's true. A lot of us have had experiences where, oh, it's so boring. Usually it's because we're in an art class and we can't control anything about the still life because the teacher set it up for us. But that doesn't mean you can't do one at home with objects that you enjoy, that have meaning to you. I mean, I have so many cool things on my desk. I mean, mostly anatomical stuff. Like I've got this little skeleton here. You know, if I put him into a still life, I'd much rather paint this than a peach. And that counts as a still life. Or I also have a spine. Why do I have a spine? 
Oh, I remember why I have a spine. I have a spine because Crosby bought this for me off of our Amazon wish list. Like, come on, this is a cool still life. Okay, you can't tell me that if there's a spine in your still life, it's boring. Because come on, this is so cool. Out. Okay, so still life is only boring if you let it be boring. Have to realize that you're the one as an artist who dictates how things work. You can't let the subject control you. You have to be the one that says, it's not going to be boring. I'm going to do something fun. I'm going to make it happen. So true, Anna. Any media can be interesting if you personalize it to make it interesting and unique to you. Any medium can be dull if you make it dull. I've seen so many dull self-portraits. Yep. And colored pencil can be beautiful and sumptuous and lovely. It can also be really, really flat and boring. It, it all depends. So any stereotype you have about any subject or media, throw it out. It, it doesn't really work that way. Lydia says, I'm applying to an art high school, so I'm a lot younger than everyone else here. That's cool. No problem. At the interview, I'll have to show my portfolio to a person who will critique it. How do I defend and explain my artwork? I think one way you can start, and you can prepare this in advance, you can explain why you made something. And actually, this is a very funny thing. A lot of us, we make work and we aren't thinking about the why. We just know, oh, I want to make this, or this is something that I think will be fun, okay? And the why doesn't have to happen before you make the work. So you might spend a lot of time working on a drawing and not really know why you're doing it. But then when you finish, you can step back and say, well, why did I paint that? There has to be a reason because one of the reasons why I think a lot of people have trouble speaking about their work is because they haven't asked themselves why. They haven't had that opportunity. And if I look at <laughs> this little skeleton here, you could say to me, well, Clara, why do you want to put a skeleton into your still life? And I could tell you, well, it's a symbol of mortality and I want to talk about life and death and all those deep things. And that's, that's fine. But ask yourself the why. So you could even, for example, Lydia, take your portfolio and for each artwork, write a list, right? Why did I do this? And once you start making that list, you're going to realize there's more and more reasons why you did what you did. Because I think a lot of us, we just don't take the time to do it because we're involved in the drawing process. So you can do that. And the other thing you can do too is do a little bit of research. Say to yourself, okay, well, I made this work about this contemporary issue. Okay. So there's a lot of things happening in the world all the time. And if you say, well, I want to make my work about women's rights, that's fine. But the thing is, a lot of people I find when they're doing portfolios, they haven't really done the research to back it up. And so what ends up happening is you get a very shallow version. Because women's rights is a huge theme. I mean, that's gigantic. And so I also say to people, listen, do the research and also get specific because women's rights is different in any country you go to. It's a completely different situation. And then you could say, well, are you talking about women's rights for elderly women? You're talking about rights for teenagers. It's so, so complicated. And so a big part of it is that people think too generally about things. They don't get specific enough. Thank you so much, Luis, for the super chat. So much appreciate your support. Keep those super chats coming, everybody, because that's the reason we can do these streams and give all of you the help that you need for your art school portfolios. Art Sneak says, saw a video on art prop about soap sculptures. Would that be a good addition to the portfolio? Absolutely. Soap sculptures are so easy because the soap is incredibly soft and you do not need a fancy knife to do that. You could do that with a pocket knife. You could probably even do that with a kitchen knife. 
a paring knife or something like that, it, it wouldn't be difficult to do. And the best part about the soap sculpture is that if you want to smooth it out, you just run it under the faucet. I do it in the video. You can all see it. It's awesome. Anyway, just go search for Art Prof Soap. You'll find it in YouTube. So TNG says, I am planning on applying, not sure where yet. It's tricky. Again, this is another place where do your research because you know how they have those rankings in the US? It's the US news ranking list. So they'll say, okay, this school's number one, two, three. That is a terrible way to pick a school. You have to do your research on the individual departments because a lot of people will say, oh, well, RISD is ranked number one. So I need to go to RISD. Well, what a lot of people don't understand is that if you want to go into animation and you go into RISD, you're not going to learn animation industry stuff. You're not going to learn about Pixar or working at Disney. That is not RISD's thing. They have an animation department that's very artsy. It's very independent filmmaker, film festival type of atmosphere. And so I say to students, hey, if your goal someday is to work at a big animation studio like Pixar or Disney, RISD's probably not the best fit. I'm not saying it can't work. I know lots of people who went to RISD who did actually end up working in the industry. It's just compared to say a place like CalArts, which is really industry oriented, it's very different. And so people don't realize that it's not the school, it's a department. You have to look at the department and say, is that the type of thing I want to do? So it's not just the school. It's really seeing what the various departments are all about. Luis is saying, how much time spent is ideal in the portfolio? There's no ideal time. Whatever amount of time it takes for you to get the results that you're looking for, that's the time. <laughs> and it's a lot. It, it's not a small amount. King Casey says, had this idea to make a pop-up book. Excited to start it because I think it will be a nice bridge between my skills, 2D and 3D. That's fantastic. See, that's great. How many art school portfolios have a pop-up book in them? Not that many. So that is where your time spent is valuable. Your time spent arguing about why can't we add manga and anime? It's a waste of your time. Spend your time thinking about stuff like this because this is absolutely the type of thing that is going to be impactful. Grace says, interested in applying to master's programs in South of California, what are the best schools? I don't know a lot about schools in California. And, and to be clear, everybody, we're talking about undergraduate programs today, but Grace, what you can do, go to ourprof.org and type in list of MFA programs. We have a whole list of various MFA programs all across the US. And you can take a look at that there because today we are gonna focus on BFA programs. Karasu says, I want to study illustration or comics. Ultimate career goal is to be a graphic novel artist. What types of art should I include? You can certainly include some graphic novel stuff. I mean, I know some high school students who are like really into it have done quite a bit, but it's fine if you've never done it ever in your life. And so that's your goal, but that doesn't have to be reflected in the portfolio. A lot of people don't get those skills that they need to make the graphic novel until they get to the art school program. I, that's why you're going <laughs> is to get those skills. So there's no reason you should feel like you will have that make the work you're passionate about, okay? Make stuff that only you can make. I looked at a portfolio a couple weeks ago and it was about their experience being the child of immigrants. And oh my gosh, there's so many stories there for them to tell. And I told them, listen, your landscape, which was about mooncakes and had this very dreamy, surreal look, this is way better than your fantasy illustrations that have dragons and European knights and things, because that's what everybody does. In fantasy illustration, dragon drawings and European knights, that's a dime a dozen. But how many people are making landscapes with mooncakes? That's the difference. 
King Casey says, love chalk pastels, but I'm always having issues with color. I like the physical action of drawing, but I'm really used to the process of mixing colors with paint. So layering feels frustrating. I suspect King Casey, I'd have to see your work to really give you an accurate response, but I suspect you're giving up on it too fast because layering colors, it takes time. It's not like paint. It's a completely different rhythm, but it is extremely valuable. And so if you are making a drawing right now in soft pastel and you're used to putting two layers, put down eight and then let's talk. <laughs> because oftentimes the problem with soft pastel, if you don't have tons of experience with it, people don't put down enough pigment. So if I look at a soft pastel drawing, usually most of the time I'm saying to people, you need four more layers because you have so little that you can't really do anything with it. Because that's the thing, like if you have too little pigment on the paper with soft pastels, of course you can't mix color. There's not enough pigment on the paper to actually make that viable. So I would say give that more time and more layers. This is great. Anna says, I encourage my students to use fabrics and textiles, dolls, food, objects specific to the cultural background. Most of my students are LGBTQ immigrants or children of and use very specific things that are meaningful to them. Yes, because that is your story. Nobody can take your story away. That is yours for a fact. <laughs> like, nobody's going to argue with you about that. So search for things like that, that are not everybody's run of the mill fantasy dragon. Lisa's asking, how can you determine a program is a good fit for you? For most people, I recommend that they look at the student work that's coming out of the school. So if you're somebody and you really, really like figurative painting and you look at the painting department of a school and all you see is abstract work, that's probably a bad fit. And it's tricky because sometimes it's harder to find the student work that's coming out of the school. Other times it's really easy. It depends on the school. But that's usually the best measure because the thing is all the college catalogs are going to say the same thing. They're all going to say, yes, we're fabulous. So <laughs> you can't really trust them and they're not really going to tell you anything specific. King Casey says, I find the advice to be specific is helpful for a lot of creative fields, not just visual arts. I gave similar advice to my friend who is writing poetry. Absolutely. I mean, here, here's the difference, okay? If I tell all of you, I live in a house. Okay, cool. That's cool, Clara. But what if I tell you, I live in a Victorian mansion? <laughs> Aren't you going to be more interested? The house is not that interesting. Victorian mansion is like, whoa, why do you live there? Are you really, really rich? Did you inherit, like, all of a sudden, when you say Victorian mansion, it's like people have so many questions for you because not everybody lives in a Victorian mansion. And so that's the difference. Again, like if you say, well, I want to make work about the environment. It's like, what part of the environment? There's so much. Like I've been editing a whole bunch of master statements this week. And I can't tell you how many statements say things like, my work is about science. It's like, you might as well just say my work is about stuff. Think about how huge science is. Even one field within science. Even if you said my work is about physics, it's still not specific enough. And so the same deal with your artwork as well. Anna says, Clara, you're my rock star, my co-teacher. I feel like I farm out so much of my work <laughs> to you. Well, right back at you, Anna, because I've learned so much from you as well and commiserating with some of the less fun parts of being an artist, but it's those conversations we need to stay alive. Thank you for the super chat, Anna. So appreciative of your support. Sophie's asking when getting jobs in the art world, how important is it to go to a school with a quote, big name? Pretty much only if you want to get a job teaching college, that's it. Nobody cares. <laughs> they really do not care, you guys. Like Jordan, who works, has worked in animation studios and he's worked at DreamWorks and all this stuff. He said that half the time they don't even ask him. 
about the school. I mean, yes, it's on his resume, but it just doesn't, like, nobody cares. They just want to know, do you have the skills? Do you have the portfolio? Are you not a jerk? <laughs> that type of thing. And it's the same thing in so many different places. Like, if you want to be an editorial illustrator and somebody looks at your portfolio, oh, wow, I really like you. They don't care what school you went to because they just want to see, do you serve the need that I am trying to fulfill? That is the most important thing. So the name of the school, and you guys, I'm sorry to tell you this, nobody cares about your grades. <laughs> like so many students in college, they're like, oh my God, I got to be minus. I'm like, you know what? No one is ever going to ask you. I mean, I really wish they would just make all college, all classes pass fail because then people wouldn't be freaking so bad because really what people want to know is, did you get the degree? They don't care what you got in your art history class, second semester, or sophomore year. It just doesn't matter. So in a lot of cases, it's not that important. Lisa says, other than hearing info about RISD animation program, how would students learn that? Does RISD explain that on their website? Absolutely not. Nope. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying is these art school websites, they will not tell you something that concrete. They'll say something like, we get our students to critically engage with the critical making of blah, blah, blah. They'll tell you that. They won't tell you something that concrete. So you just need us to spill the tea. <laughs> We are very good at that. Izzy says, how do different art school portfolios differ depending on what you're looking to do? Usually they're just all different. I, I just think when you apply to be a first year art school student, you haven't gone through the program yet. You don't have the skills that you're looking to get. Like somebody earlier said, I want to do graphic novels, but you probably don't have any of the skills you need to be a graphic novelist. I mean, maybe you have a small percentage, but not that much. And so my guess is that they're just all different. That's pretty much it. Hi, INS. I'm so happy that you're here on your first live stream. Who here is on their first live stream? Who here has watched but has never commented? And now we're going to bring you all out of the woodwork because I just love it when people say hello. It's just the nicest thing. I mean, you would think after all these years, I wouldn't care that much, but I do. I totally do. Like when people tell me this is my first time watching live, I just think that's phenomenal. I never get sick of that. Okay. Like people will say to me, oh, I'm sure you heard. I'm like, I do, but I love it. I will never get tired of it. Yes, absolutely. Ayana says, I want to major in sculpture but I worry I do not have the time stray away from painting, which I love as well. You can always come back to it. There's no such thing as being away from something for quote, too long. I mean, I did my master's degree in sculpture because I wanted to learn something really different for my master's program. And I really, at the time when I applied for my MFA in sculpture, I was like, no, but I'm a painter. I'm just going to learn sculpture for now because I think it's fun and I think it's engaging. And guess what? I never went back to painting. <laughs> Maybe that's not the answer you want to hear, but you'll find that if you major in sculpture, you're going to learn things that are going to enhance your painting. Like it's all going to the same place, you guys. Okay. There's no such thing as one experience taking away too much time from another. I, I just think about it. It's one really big, amazing bowl of soup. It's all going in there. It's all good. Okay. You can't mess up this bowl of soup. It's always going to be tasty and luscious and all those things. Artful Variety says, what majors do you feel like are going to be phased out in the next couple of years? Hmm. I, I can't think of any that will be. I mean, I know everybody's really worried about AI, but AI is not the first technological advance to happen in the art world. I mean, it is very different. People have no idea what's going on with it right now. But I can't imagine that any of these will be phased out. Unless there's one really obvious one that I, I'm not <laughs> remembering. Maybe 
some of you can tell me in the chat if you think there is something that could be phased out at some point. I don't really think that's going to be the case, but that's my thought. Karasu says, is cartoon art in other styles besides anime, manga, okay for an illustration, comics, program, portfolio? Yes, absolutely. Make sure, though, that it's really your character because it's amazing how sometimes we don't think we're copying stuff. <laughs> like you totally have no intention of copying at all. And it's like, we end up doing it anyway. And so that's where I would say with character design, what you have to think about, don't just design the look of the character. You gotta write a story. Like I can't believe so many people do character designs and they haven't written a story yet. They're just designing the look. But the thing is the look of a character is deeply embedded, rooted in that character's story. And you know something, you don't have to invent your own character. You could say, I'm gonna do my version of this. I mean, for me, if I was gonna do character design, I would totally do Japanese spirits. Because, oh man, those spirits and demons in Japanese mythology, they are nasty. <laughs> I feel like they would be great character designs. But that's the important thing is that you do the whole character and the character is much more than what they look. That's the important thing. And we have Willish, who says, self-taught artists in Ghana. Love to know how hard it would be to get a scholarship for art school or if it's possible at all. Yeah, if you're an international student and you want to go to school in the US, they don't give scholarships for international students. So sorry to tell you that, but that is the case. And King Casey says, soothing to know that the degree isn't a top priority in a lot of cases, I've been so worried about it since I'm so torn between the experience of art school and the financial burden of it. Yes, it's very difficult. And don't ever think that going to a fancy program is going to solve all your problems. It won't necessarily. In fact, okay, I'm going to try really hard to not to go on a rant. <laughs> but one thing I have noticed, because I've taught at RISD for so long and because now a lot of the students I had are much older. Like when I had Lauren way, way back, I mean, she's like in her thirties now and has been out of school for a while. And I have kept in touch with a lot of my students and I can't believe a lot of the Kool-Aid that art schools get students to drink. And a lot of them feel just so much pressure about this like very narrow-minded way of thinking about things that really hurts them later because they get almost brainwashed into thinking that certain things are bad, certain things are good. I mean, I cannot tell you all the amount of just crap I got for being on YouTube. It's like, oh, you're on YouTube, you must be trash. I was like, no, it's another way to educate. That's to me what YouTube is. But art school is that narrow-minded sometimes. And the thing is, it kind of makes me laugh because I know the RISD students, I know they're all watching YouTube. I mean, who doesn't? We all watch it for one reason or another. And I just can't believe that art school for a place that's supposed to be so creative and liberal can be awfully narrow-minded. And I know a lot of illustration students who would call me after they graduated and they say, I feel so terrible about myself because I haven't been able to do this, this, and this, and I feel like a failure. And I'm like, listen, being an editorial illustrator and doing illustrations for The New Yorker is like 0.01% of the illustration world. There's such a big world out there. And I, I just was so mad that a lot of the professors put editorial illustration at The New Yorker on this pedestal. Like if you get that, you're set. But if you don't, you're a failure. And so art school has its problems too. I'm not saying that um, it's perfect by any means. There's advantages, but there's also disadvantages. So there are a lot of students I found they really had to work a lot of toxic mentalities that some art schools do promote, unfortunately. La Playground is asking, is digital art taken less seriously in portfolios? I don't think so. I think that is way past. 
<laughs> I think when digital art first came on the scene, it's sort of like the AI thing. It's like people were like, what? I, like I didn't grow up with digital art, didn't exist. We had no iPads or anything like that. And I, I don't think so. I highly doubt that to be the case. Oh, look at all of you are saying hello, Belinda, Helen G, manager, Ash, Drosh slash play. Oh, I'm so happy you all said hello. Yay. That's so cool, you guys. Thank you so much for the super chip, the super sticker, <laughs> 10,000 gross. We so much appreciate your support. And ooh, we have Kuro from South Africa. And we have, I think I lost that comment. Sorry about that. I love this comment from Jaylene. It's also amazing to build on your portfolio and see your true art style emerge. Yeah, we're talking a lot about how stressful <laughs> art school portfolios are, but you know what? You're making work and you're learning and grow. I mean, you can't work on an art school portfolio and not get better. Yeah, you need it for the application, but think about what a different artist you're gonna be when you're done with that portfolio. That's the fun part. I mean, I suspect that on some level we like doing this, <laughs> right? Even though it's, wow, very challenging sometimes. Oh, thanks, Sophie. Been watching your videos for four years now. It's been wonderful seeing the channel grow and it's helped so much. I'm kind of bumming this week, you guys, because we just hit 151 subs. 151,000, sorry. <laughs> More than 151 subs. And... Oh man, YouTube is not showing me love right now. Like I've been posting stuff and it's just crickets. Like our live stream numbers have plummeted. I mean, I know I'm sort of partially to blame for that because we don't stream as much remotely as much as we used to. And a lot of people are like, oh, you must just be coasting. I'm like, no. People are like, oh, you, you just make so much money. I'm like, no. Oh my gosh, if I did the math, I think I make a dollar an hour. <laughs> based on the amount of time that we put into the YouTube channel. So yes, it is not coasting. It's it's as hard as it was a long time ago. King Casey says, sometimes I feel bad about the fact that I have so many works in progress at once, but it honestly just helps me develop my skills and ideas. I want to explore even more. Oh my God, me. <laughs> you should see, okay? Look, look at this. Maybe you can all see this. <laughs> Do you see this list? This is my list of all the videos. I see I have four shorts. Look, there's so many. Look, see this? I have like, what? Six DSLR videos. I have to shoot this. I have to do the woodcut tutorial. And today I was like shooting more stuff. I'm like, why are you shooting more footage? You don't need more footage to edit, Clara. And yet somehow I find a way to do it anyway. It's really silly. <laughs> Oh, cool. Name, so happy that you're commenting. One tip I can give, preparing an art school portfolio is don't be afraid to be yourself. Yes, you're going to see stuff in those accepted art school portfolios and you're going to say, well, everybody else is doing this, so I better do it because all those people got in. I mean, you can, but you should do the work you are really into. That's what makes the work unique. Like people ask me, well, how do I make it not look like everybody else's? And the answer is to do something that only you can do, okay? Something that is from your experience. And we all, as much as sometimes we don't feel like we're unique or we have something new to say, we do. You just have to find it. That, <laughs> that's a really hard thing is sometimes it's the thing that is so common to you that you take it for granted. You don't even think it's that special. But then you tell somebody else, like, oh my gosh, that's really cool. You should really pursue that. And so sometimes it's a big part of that. Thanks, 10K. Yeah, and the thing is, I really just can't go back to streaming all the time because we need to keep the lights on. <laughs> so it's one of those things, I mean, I, I need to clone myself. You guys ever find a cloning machine please let me know because i would be very very happy yes i am doing thanks to a wonderful sponsor in our community 
I am going to shoot a DSLR tutorial um, on woodcut. And I'm so excited to do that because woodcut, I've been wanting to do that forever. But oftentimes I, I can't justify spending my time on the more obscure content. So when somebody from the community steps in and sponsors the video, it makes it so I can make that stuff. That's like the really fun stuff because it, it's just, it doesn't get a lot of traction because it's so obscure, but I love doing that. I wish I could share more of that stuff with all of you. Yeah. Oh, I love this from Belinda. I take being a twin for granted, but people regularly lose their minds that I'm a twin. Artistic commentary on twinhood. Absolutely. I don't know what it's like to be a twin. I think that would be a great thing to talk about. And then there's always what it's, I don't know if you're fraternal or identical twins or anything, but I imagine, oh my gosh, I feel like you could make art about being a twin for your whole life and never run out of things to talk about. And that's the fun thing is once you find something really specific, sometimes people will say to me, oh, well, I'm worried if I pick this topic, it's going to be too narrow. I'm worried that there's not going to be enough time, enough content here. I'm going to get through it really fast. But then what happens is people, then they dig into it and they realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more here than I ever could have anticipated. And the reason I know now is because I took the time to investigate that, to think about that, to make it possible. So a lot of this is in your hands. A lot of this is realizing that, yes, you do have things to say that are different and you're not like everybody else. And it's hard to see that if you're in your own head. If you don't talk to anybody, it's very hard. And the thing is, you have to talk to artists. <laughs> I'm sorry, non-artist people, but I know you mean well, but you're not that helpful sometimes <laughs> when it comes to this brainstorming stuff. You know, I'm sure we've all had that very well-meaning relative or sibling or whatever wants to help us with our art careers. And I've had students say to me, well, but my parents, I'm like, your parents don't know anything about this field. They're coming into this with no knowledge. It'd be like if you guys came to me and said, hey, can you give me skiing advice? I'd be like, no, <laughs> I would give you the worst skiing advice ever. So yes, don't worry about that. Oh, okay. Belinda's identical. Oh, Amanda, I didn't know that you were fraternal. That's so cool. Yeah, see, look at this. We already have, Belinda, all these people who are saying, wow, that's really fascinating and unusual. And absolutely, Lisa, finding your voice is a journey. So the journey has been fun. You won't figure this stuff overnight, but that's what makes it really good, <laughs> is that it does take that time to figure that out. Ah! <laughs> Lisa, I love this. Some family members can be trained. I love this. Well, you'll have to uh, you have to do some coaching for us. <laughs> I have yet to be able to pull that off myself um, because my poor husband, he just gets roped into these things and he just never is given a choice. It's really mean of me to do that, but I kind of can't help myself. Anna says, did you ever get back to the aging idea, Clara? Always seemed like fertile ground. Yeah, I haven't gotten back to it yet. I'm still thinking about it because you know what? I'm aging and oh boy, you guys, this this is the year that I was like, dude, I'm getting older. I mean, you, you sort of feel that for a while, but it's like when it starts showing up physically, <laughs> you're like, oh wow, that's a lot of white hair. I mean, I don't have a lot yet, but compared to like before I had one hair at a time and I would just pull it out. And now it's like, okay, I can't pull them out anymore. <laughs> There's way more than before. <laughs> snowboarding advice, fall until you figure it out. Oh my gosh, I went snowboarding once. And you know what? I spent the entire day on my butt. It sucked so bad. I was so, so bad at it. Oh my gosh, I was like, never again. I can't ever do this. Ah! <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you're all here helping each other. And if you watch this playback, let's give each other some more love because we need the support. There aren't a lot of people out there rooting for us. I'm here rooting for all of you. And I, I mean, I'm sorry to be dramatic about this, but I know when people start getting their letters 
about admission. It's, it's very, very stressful. And so I just want to tell you all, I'm going to be here for you. Okay. Whether you're getting in where you want to or not, we're, we're going to be here for you guys that whole way through. All right, everybody, we have new Art Prof services. We are now offering, in addition to artist calls, portfolio critiques, and statement editing, personal art curriculums. I'm really excited about this. So a personal art curriculum is where we customize a curriculum for you. It's a selection of comprehensive lessons and prompts to help you realize your goals. So you end up getting a slideshow. And the slideshow addresses five areas that we think you should work on based on your goal. So if you want to say to us, okay, well, I really want to get better at portraits and I really want to get better at doing backgrounds. So we have all these curriculums that I assemble, like I basically pick from our absurd library of over a thousand videos. And I it create basically, the best way to describe it, it's like a fitness regime, but it's for artists. And I'm really excited about this because we have such a gigantic background of videos. But I know for a lot of people, it's overwhelming because it's, oh my God, there's so many videos on your channel, Clara. What do I do? And at a certain point, you do need things customized. And so the way I see these personal art curriculums is that we really target exactly, fill in the gaps, capture those things that you didn't even know you needed. And so we have those. And then the other thing is that the portfolio critiques, we've been doing those forever, okay? So the portfolio critiques we've done, they are 30 minute video critiques and it's me on audio talking about the work. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, but this is new. I'm very excited about this. So this is a portfolio critique, but it's as a slideshow. Look at this, oh my gosh. The, the nerd in me just loves doing this stuff. So you submit, eight pieces because the slideshows, they, they take a while to assemble. And I basically add comments and suggestions and I add diagrams and I embed links and everything. And I was thinking this would be really fun for people to get the feedback, to literally see specific things because I know one thing that drives people crazy when they get feedback is when it's too vague. And so I just love that on this slide, I can just make a box for, oh, maybe get rid of this. I can make this blue line that says maybe crop here. And I, I am such a nerd. I love making slideshows. So for me, this is really, really fun. So if any of you are looking for more support as an artist, maybe you're trying to break into an industry, you need support for your BFA or your MFA applications, we're here for you. I want everything to be really customized to each person because a lot of content is helpful to a point. At a certain point, you need the feedback to make really concrete progress. So you can go down to the YouTube video description below. There are a bunch of links to all of our various services and take a look at that. You can always comment and ask me questions and I will reply. And Big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are why I can come on the stream and help people for free. I really think that this is an important help to support young artists and what they're trying to do. And those of you who are top Patreon supporters, you guys are the ones that make that happen. And so a lot of people, I think one of the reasons they support us is because they know that when they support us, we are supporting a global audience of people. And so it, it's like it, what goes around comes around. It's awesome. I, I'm so grateful for all of that. That said, though, I am sweating because the Patreon is the lowest it's ever been in a couple years. And I, I'm a little sad. Same thing with YouTube. Like, I just, <laughs> this is not a good week for me. I, I'm not trying to make this about myself, but ugh, YouTube, Patreon, not giving me a lot of love right now. So anyway. Visit artprof.org for content that is not available on YouTube. Use the search bar. If you think we have a video or no, if there's a topic you want a video on, chances are we have a video. So use that search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. Subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.